Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the eighth meeting in 2015 of the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee. Everyone present is reminded to switch off mobile phones as they do affect the broadcasting system. As meeting papers are provided in digital format, you may see tablets being used during the meeting. Uh, no apologies have been received. The first item on the agenda is for the committee to decide whether to take item three, consideration of its approach to scrutiny of the Harbour Scotland Bill in private. Are members agreed? Thank you. The second item on our agenda today is for the committee to take further evidence on its freight transport in Scotland inquiry. This week the committee will hear from representatives from retail and shipping sectors. Can I welcome Paul Barker, Country Manager, Unifeeder, Stan Van Est, Managing Director, DFDS Seaways, and Justin Kirkhope, National Transport Support Manager at the Cooperative Group. Good morning, gentlemen. Um, the witnesses have not requested to make an opening statement, so we will move straight uh, to questions. Perhaps I could uh, kick off by asking you to provide the committee with an overview of your business and its role in the Scottish freight transport sector. Who would like to begin? <laughs> um, the cooperative uh, group, um, we operate uh, around 2,800 food stores in the UK. We're the fifth largest food retailer in the UK. Um, we also su uh, provide supply chain and distribution services to a further 1,200 cooperative stores, so a total of 4,000 stores. Um, we have a turnover of around 10.5 billion. Um, in terms of Scotland specifically, and just to say as well, um, we are the fifth largest food retailer, but unlike the, the bigger four retailers, we're unique in terms of the fact that we are, we are a cooperative and we are owned by our members. Um, in terms of Scotland specifically, um, we actually operate 400 of our own stores in Scotland and we provide supply chain and logistics distribution facilities for a further 200 cooperative stores, including those for the likes of Scott Mid Cooperative and also for uh, a number of small community cooperatives. Uh, our reach in Scotland uh, stretches from Shetland, Orkney, across to the Western Isles, uh, down through Caithness. We have quite a large presence in Inverness. We have obviously a large presence in the Central Belt and obviously stores down into Dumfries and Galloway and East Lothian. Um, in terms of um, the operation from our new house uh, composite distribution centre, we um, make around about 5,500 deliveries uh, from that site each week. Um, we've got about 350 pieces of transport equipment on the road at any one time. Um, we handle about 1.1 million cases a week out of that site for Scotland alone. Um, and we've also got a facility in Inverness which is a cross dock which allows us to deliver to stores to the north and to the east of Inverness. Um, so... So we move along the way? Yes. Um, we do have a slightly smaller presence in, in Scotland. Um, I represent the UFDS Seaways. Uh, we operate a ferry service between Rosite and Zeebrugge. Um, we employ a number of people here in Scotland in Rosite, uh, where we have a, uh, a ferry operation and an agency that is uh, performed by, by Dan on the ship's agency. Um, we run the service to Zeebrugge, um, and this is one of the 26 services that we operate in uh, Northwest Europe. Um, the FDS um, both has a logistics division and a seaways division, of which I represent the seaways division as such. Um, the FDS logistics has a number of offices in Scotland as well, where we're primarily involved in the, uh, in the salmon trade. Um, we have approximately uh, 40,000 units that we carry on uh, on the Rosite Seboiga service. Um, westbound trade is primarily trade cars. We have a number of uh, automotive customers. Uh, we carry 21,000 containers on an annual basis and approximately 6,000 trailers, uh, both in and export. Um, our customer base is a, is a mix of um, industry retail as well. Um, it's uh, the Scottish whisky trade, of course, as uh, both uh, an export and uh, some of the elements that go into whiskies as, a, as import. Um, so it's a mix of different cargo types as such. Um, we, um, uh, we have a one vessel operation. It's the Finlandia Seaways, which is a row row service, um, and uh, it sails three times a week uh, between Rosite and Zeebrugge. 
Um, we in total operate approximately 50 vessels across uh, Northwest Europe. We now have a first um, uh, step into the Mediterranean as well, where we operate a service be between Marseille and Tunis. Uh, so this is for us a, uh, an important service that we've been operating for a while, uh, previously under the header of Norfolk Line, um, and that was acquired by DFDS. Um, so we've been operating the service from 2008 onwards. Initially, this was a, a combined passenger and freight service. Uh, operated by the Scottish Viking. We then moved into uh, a two-vessel operation, uh, but because of falling demand, uh, we, we uh, had to uh, cancel one vessel, and we now operate it with the one vessel uh, that I mentioned before, the Finlandia Seaways. Yeah. My name is Paul Barker from Unifeeder. Uh, we are the largest feeder operator in Europe. Um, that may mean nothing to some people what feeder is. The best way of describing it is the business is in two elements. One is we are the last mile, or the last marine mile and the first marine mile for probably the top 20 shipping companies in the world, bringing in, uh, combining with the, the mother ships to bring in uh, cargo in and out of Scotland. We also uh, operate a short sea division, which is intra-European deliveries. Um, we operate um, roughly in Northern Europe, 47 vessels calling 49 ports in Northern Europe from Rotterdam up through into the Baltic on a weekly basis. Um, we operate two services into Grangemouth. Um, one is coming from Hamburg, which connects Scotland to Hamburg, and the second one connects to Rotterdam. Uh, the mix of cargoes we have on there is probably one of the, the most poignant ones is we bring Russian standard vodka in and we take Scotch whiskey out. Um, whether that's synergy, I'm not sure, but that's the kind of... Best. So again, we're working very much with a lot of the retailers, a lot of the shippers that are importing and exporting to and from uh, Scotland. OK, that's very helpful. Thank you. Based on the reach of your respective businesses, how would you describe the current uh, infrastructure that exists to support the freight industry in Scotland? And what improvements, if any, would you identify? I think from our perspective, obviously... Um, because our focus is primarily marine, um, we, we buy in our road services or rail services in Scotland. Um, and I think the benefit of it, but the curse of it, is it's a relatively small community. There is a set number of carriers and it's not increasing. If somewhat, it's de decreasing. So it's, a, it's quite a closed market. Um, competition is always always interesting but I think it's um, that's one observation that we find at peak times when it's when the system is full it's full uh, and that creates backlogs for us do to address that or not um, <laughs> I could get on my hobby horse now about general industry things and it, it is my chance yeah <laughs> I, I mean I, for my sins I uh, before I came into the marine sector I was in the road sector and I, and I sat as chairman of the FTA and my biggest criticism of my own industry is we're not a sexy industry to come into. You know, the average age of a, a driver is not mid-20s, mid-30s, it's mid-40s, mid-50s. Um, so I think actually getting more of a, of a cohort of people into the industry would, would be a good start. I, that's just an observation. Yeah, in terms of that backlog which you mentioned, did you have anything specific in mind there? Um, no, not really. I mean, it, it, as I say, once the system is full and we've, you know, we've got a vessel coming in with maybe 100 units on, it might take us three or four days to clear it as opposed to a normal two days. So the work gets done, it just gets done slower. And obviously that impacts on uh, the classic thing is if we're delivering it to supermarkets, um, everything backlogs a little bit. So it's more capacity than, than any... I don't think there's a silver bullet out there. That uh, you are could there any specific... Um, measures that you would see as being able to increase capacity or bring about a modal shift that would reduce capacity? I think my ongoing debate with fourth ports is please unload my vessel quicker. <laughs> work quicker, work longer. I mean, it's like the last few days. You know, the, the unfortunate thing of our industry is when, it, when the wind blows, we don't work. Mm -hmm. Either the vessel stops or the cranes stop. And, and that's all driven by safety. So my wish for all the terminals in the UK is to work much quicker, much cheaper. <laughs> but that's a selfish view. Okay, Mr Van Est. 
Yeah, I think um, to distinguish ourselves a little bit from Unifeeder, our operation is even more characterized by, uh, uh, by fast turnaround time. Um, we operate the service. We, um, in order to enable us to have a three weekly call um, in and out of our site, uh, we only allow ourselves a four hour turnaround time because of the rest of the, uh, the time we actually need to spend at sea. Um, so we have four hours to turn around the vessel, and that means that you need to discharge 100 units, and you need to load approximately 100 units as well. It's a rural operation, so that means that uh, as compared to containers, uh, everything is on a, either a roll muffy or it actually has wheels itself, uh, so it can drive off and on. Um, so the, the turnaround time is by default already a bit faster. Um, I can agree with uh, my colleague here that, uh, uh, that the infrastructure is... Uh, uh, let's say, uh, fairly limited in the sense that uh, there's only one provider that can provide uh, services to us in the east coast of Scotland, and that is Fort Ports. Um, there's one railroad berth available that we can use uh, on the entire west, uh, east coast of Scotland, um, and that is owned and operated by Fort Ports. Um, and that makes the position, um, let's say, yeah, not necessarily competitive, um, and uh, it can and it has created service issues with uh, with us as a customer to Fort Ports. Um, so if there would be any suggestions or changes as regards infrastructure, it would obviously be that there would be investments needed uh, to allow for additional railroad berths on the east coast of Scotland, and that will also then be operated by other, by other parties than Fort Ports. Um, and I know that uh, Charles Emmett has also been here to, uh, to present his view on this, and it's probably contradictory to what we would believe is necessary on, uh, to develop the, uh, the rural industry in Scotland further. Uh, but they are, of course, in a, in a certain situation where there's simply no competition for them. Um, and and we, we see this not only in price levels, but also in service levels. Okay, thank you. Mr. Kirkhope. Yeah, I think in terms of um, road, obviously we welcome recent developments with the M74 extension. Um, we can see the work going on on the M8 from outside our distribution centre at Newhouse in Lanarkshire, uh, which is welcome again. Um, I think um, in terms of uh, the focus on the likes of the A83, which provides a vital link to some of our community stores, um, that which are obviously accessed via that road, that's important to us. Uh, we welcome the proposal to dual the A9. Um, again, that, that will certainly help. And obviously the speed limit, the, the trial for the increased speed limit on the A9 is something that we do welcome. And um, seeing some of the feedback from the Road Haulage Association who presented to you last month, um, you know, we're seeing some benefits in terms of, you know, if we can get product up to Caithness half an hour earlier, fresh product. Obviously, the supply chain in Scotland means that Newhouse is quite often at the end of a supply chain that starts in the English Midlands. So fresh product is actually going from Newhouse to Caithness um, the faster we can get it on the shelf and get it there so that the customers have got that fresh product first thing in the morning, the better it is for us. Um, so, so we do welcome some of those improvements. Um, we'd like to see um, a review of what is happening south of the border in terms of increased speed limits with LGVs to see you know, whether Scotland could do something similar on that. Um, and we appreciate that the cautious approach has been taken on the A9 because obviously road safety is absolutely key, um, but I think there's been some significant improvements there. Um, in terms of rail infrastructure, um, we are currently bringing product from uh, the English Midlands from Coventry to Moss End and also Grangemouth, uh, slow-moving ambient lines, grocery lines, and we use WH Malcolms to do that. Um, and that's been actually really, really good in terms of reliability. But um, what we would like to see is um, in terms of rail, um, some provision of a seven-day, full seven-day service. That's one of the things that's absolutely critical. I, I don't think it's come up in the, the previous evidence. Um, there's been a lot of evidence about rail, but one of the key things on, on UK, not, and not just in Scotland, on UK key freight routes, there's no provision for Sunday night, sorry, Saturday night services um, on key routes. Now, I understand that's mostly to do with engineering, However, if there was a move to make alternative and diversionary routes uh, available on Saturday nights, we could look at moving significantly. We'd have more opportunity to move volume onto rail away from road if we could actually get uh, more of a 24-7 type operation. So, so we can run six days. That's fine. It's the Saturday evenings. And, and because 
grocery is, the, is an industry where the lead times are very, very important in terms of um, if we can reduce lead times uh, between the store placing an order or the systems placing an order for stores and them actually being on shelf, then the accuracy of those orders can be improved so that the availability to the end customer is, um, is as good as it can be. So that, That's certainly a point that we can put to Network Rail when we have them before the committee uh, in the near future. Uh, Mike, did you have a... Yes, um, thank you, convener. I was, uh, I was just very interested. When fourth ports were in, given evidence to the committee, they suggested to us, in the face of a bit of mild criticism, that we should speak to their customers who are um, over the moon with the services they, they supply according to them. So I was very interested to hear that that may not be exactly the case. And I just wondered if... Um, Mr. Barker and Mr. Van Es could perhaps um, be a wee bit more specific in terms of, um, you know, what, what, what would improve things? I mean, y y you've mentioned another rural berth, and perhaps Mr. Barker um, could be a bit more specific. Fourth Ports, were at pains to point out to us their investment programme and, you know, what, what they're seeking to achieve, but um, I, I just wonder if that's what, if that would really meet your needs. And then I'll just, um, with your indulgence, con convener, um, uh, that Mr Kirkhope um, just touched on something which uh, um, the Parliament talked about yesterday in a debate about the dairy sector. Um, I would refer you to my colleague Mr uh, Day's speech of yesterday afternoon, um, in which uh, they talked about the dairy sector um, in Scotland's produce, dairy produce, actually finding, finding great difficulty getting into the supply chain in Scotland. And in terms of the relevance to our discussion this morning, you mentioned that you know, um, most of your, most of your pro fresh produce is coming from far south. I just wonder if you could um, alleviate that problem by sourcing from within Scotland. I think it's a very good point. I mean, sourcing is not my area of expertise. Um, we do source, for example, milk within Scotland. We have Scottish-specific milk, for example, um, and butter as well, for example. But in terms of other fresh lines, I'm, I'm not familiar in terms of that. That's not really my area. But what I can do, I can take away with me, and we can get something in writing in terms of submission about where fresh product is sourced from for Scotland. In which it shortens the supply chain, the transport route, if you see what I mean. That would seem to make sense in terms of this morning's discussion and perhaps relieve some of the problems you've touched on. But, um, I, I mean, this is almost an aside to our discussion. I'm, I'm keen to hear about the ports and fourth ports in particular. Yeah, uh, to answer that question, uh, I, I've seen the session where uh, Mr. Hammond was here and, uh, and I've also seen the questions that you, that you raised there. Um, I had the same feeling when I first visited the port of our site as you had when you did your site visit. Um, and uh, to be fair, I was also ashamed of the port facilities that are there. Um, if you compare that to any of the terminals that we operate in the rest of Europe, uh, the facilities are extremely poor. Uh, there's potholes everywhere. Um, health and safety issues uh, are arising. Um, and it's fair to say that there is a lack of investment in the facilities that they operate themselves. Uh, I can't say that about the other facilities that they operate, but for sure, where we are a customer in Rosite, uh, there is a need for additional investments just to service the area, for example. Uh, in addition, there's a, there's a lack of investment in equipment that is used to, uh, to operate the ferry service. And there's a lack in tugmasters, there's a lack in reed stackers. They tend to break down quite frequently, um, leading to uh, delays. Uh, and as I explained before, uh, we have a very tight schedule. We have a four-hour turnaround time. We keep statistics on this, and uh, it hardly ever happens that we, have a, and that we achieve a four-hour turnaround time. If I compare this to the port of Zeebrugge, which is on the other side of the operation, uh, they always manage to operate the vessel within four hours. Uh, so this is clear evidence that there, uh, there is a lack of investments and a lack of uh, operational awareness at fourth ports. Like I said, for us, there is no alternative. Would there be an alternative, we would easily switch to someone else, and we would do so straight away. So... Point you've just made uh, on which one? The on point about the 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 lack of of uh, turnaround for within the four hour. Yeah. So I mean, there's um, it's a rural operation, so you need talkmasters to operate the service. So um, no, I meant uh, written 
um, ah, sorry, yes, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. I mean, we we, are, we keep the statistics on every departure, so we can provide that information. Okay, yeah. that's great. Thank yeah. you, yeah. Mr. Barker. I think I would I would agree with Steen is is that the the level of investment is relative to the appetite of fourth ports to meet the demand, and the competition is non-existent. Um, I think. You know, we're in very much the same situation as DFDS. You know, I always paraphrase. You know, we just run a marine bus service, and pretty much like buses, if they're late, everyone gets a bit stressed, and it all kind of gets a bit uh, difficult. And I think one of the things that we see is is the level of investment um, f compared to other terminals uh, is is lacking. Um, now, whether that's driven by their appetite to invest or whether they're by the um, the conditions that they've come from. But we can certainly see our market growing in Scotland. But at a point in time, it's weighing the balance of more capacity on our vessels weighed against a longer turnaround time. And we actually can't sacrifice the turnaround time. Um, so I think it's, it is a... And I would agree with, 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 with Steen as well, is that the level of equipment is somewhat of an older vintage than, dare I say, other terminals that we, uh, we visit, to be polite. Deep, do you have a small yeah, short you, just a very quick point to Mr Kirkhope. I was very interested in your points about the increase in speed limit uh, trial in the A9, and you may or may not know, but I was very actively involved in leading the campaign from HGV drivers to get that increase, and I was pleased the Scottish Government um, looked at that. Um, there's a couple of qu very quick points. You made the point yourself that this month, England and Wales will increase speed limits to 50 and 60 for single carriageway and dual carriageways. So we've got this almost ludicrous cross-border war going to be breaking out where uh, vehicles have to change, uh, reduce speeds when they cross the, the border. Um, f first of all, what is your view about increasing, uh, making the speeds consistent with England and Wales? And secondly, do you share the view of the haulage industry who've told me that it's actually less admitting driving uh, at 50 because you're in a higher gear. Uh, so ironically, counterintuitively, increasing speed actually reduces emissions going from 40 to 50. So you both have a, this is good for climate change, I think good for road safety, but I do frankly see it ludicrous that we have different speed limits from England and Wales. Yes, I mean, I, I would agree. I mean, we, we set our vehicles, our LGVs, have a mm. speed limiter set at 52 because we, we've done trials we run at 56, um, which is obviously the, the legal permissible maximum. Um, 52 is seen as a sort of sweet spot. Um, you know, once the vehicles get into the highest gear, that's definitely seen as an advantage over 40. Um, I think that the, the, the fuel consumption at between 40 and 50 is negligible in terms of the, 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 the change there. So we'd certainly support that. I think as well, I, I, I support what you say about you know, cross-border um, having to change speed limits. Uh, vehicle drivers having to be aware that when they cross the A1 at Berwick, they have to then reduce speed. Um, so, so we would definitely support the, an increase to, to 50 miles an hour throughout the, the A road network. Um, I understand why the A9 was was handled in the way it was because safety was obviously the, the highest priority. But I think you know maybe taking on some of the learnings once we've actually once once the English speed limits. Um, got a few months under its belt, perhaps we can get some evidence of whether there's been any in, in, increase in, in, in accidents or, or, or you know, safety issues. Okay, um, Mr Barker and Mr Van Ess, I mean, obviously we're looking at the freight transport industry in Scotland, but we can't look at that in isolation. I'm just wondering, given the, the global, European and global reach of your businesses, whether you were aware of any trends within the, the wider um, industry that are impacting on Scottish freight transport? We've seen an actual growth in, in volumes in and out of Scotland. Um, for us, the situation in Scotland is there is actually more exports than there is imports. So we actually position empty equipment into Scotland to load product out. So we, we're very active in, in trying to search out imports into Scotland and we're seeing a slight increase. I wouldn't say a huge increase, but it's starting to come. I mean, we, we, we cover mainly in our Northern European network um, 
a sweep from Rotterdam round into into the Baltics, into St. Petersburg and, uh, and, and the rest of uh, that area. Um, and we're starting to see a, a slight increase in, in, in imports, uh, which, is, which is a good sign. Um, apart from that, nothing significant from my perspective. No, I think it's, it's, it's fair to say that uh, if you look at the, the various operators that, uh, that either have container operations or rural operations like ourselves, um, we only carry a very small portion of import and export out of Scotland. Uh, and unfortunately, the majority of the traffic actually goes uh, to southern ports uh, and even down to the channel. Um, so if I look at DFDS Logistics, which is uh, our sister company, um, they transport salmon all the way down south to go to France. Um, so they take the channel tunnel for this. Um, and it's actually transport that is going in and out of Scotland. Mm. Uh, so you could wonder if there should be some more sustainable, uh, let's say, environmentally friendly alternatives other than to drive uh, fish that is uh, sourced in, in Scotland all the way down to France uh, using the entire road network in the UK. Um, and this is a sign of, of a lot of uh, cargo and goods being available in Scotland, but actually not being moved in the most environmentally friendly way. Um, and this is simply price related. Mm -hmm. I would agree. Excellent. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Alex, you've got some questions. Yes, thank you. My uh, questions are specifically for Mr. Kirkhope. Uh, first of all, can you describe the specific features of the retail distribution uh, network that impact on the use of road freight in Scotland? Okay. Um, in terms of the how we use the road network, or... Um, I mean, basically, obviously, we, we, we're running a lot of traffic on, and, you know, um, between the central belt and Inverness, for example, is a key route for us. But obviously, we're using a lot of local roads as well because we've got stores in every postal area, virtually, um, within Scotland. Um, so, you know, the, the, the reliability of the trunk road network is very important to us. Um, obviously, I've mentioned the A83 and, and previous landslides and obviously very pleased to see that there's been some work done on that over the last couple of years in terms of um, improving resilience and obviously the, the old military roads been opened up as an alternative diversionary route so that's important but but obviously that the last mile into the stores is is quite important for us as well in terms of you know the, the way local authorities keep up um, local road networks um, because that can be as frustrating um, if, if we've got problems with local roads and congestion and parking and that sort of thing um, we, have, we do have some particular challenges in city centres with parked vehicles, access to stores. A lot of our stores are quite historic in terms of, you know, been trading for over 100 years, so they've been designed for a horse and cart. Um, so, you know, for example, in the centre of Glasgow, um, so we, we um, would welcome opportunities, for example, to look at um, more nighttime deliveries. And that was something that was trialled to, to a small extent, but, but quite successfully during the Commonwealth Games. And we had some good discussions with the local authorities then, and we were able to deliver a handful of stores during the night. Unfortunately, that's, that's obviously, uh, those stores have gone back to daytime delivery. But what we've done in London, for example, we've actually been working again with the local authorities to try and get some of the nighttime deliveries that we instituted for the London Olympics back to nighttime. And the, the advantages there are if we can do it considerately, if we can deliver quietly so that we're not upsetting neighbours and residents, then we can actually take vehicles off the road during peak times. Um, we can reuse our vehicle fleet, which is obviously more efficient. Um, so, you know, we can, it, it, it's effectively a win-win uh, because, you know, we're double utilising the resource and we're reducing congestion on the roads when, it's, uh, when they're the most busy. on that point, we visited the uh, Bindestadt in uh, Nijmegen uh, Consolidation Centre uh, and they did a lot of the stuff that you're talking about, but can I ask you uh, the Glasgow example that you used, the Commonwealth Games example, have you f followed that up with them? Has there been any uh, positive noises from Glasgow that they would consider doing the, the nighttime deliveries that they had very successfully in, in, uh, during the Commonwealth Games? It's one of the things that's on our to-do list. I mean, we've had some good discussions in London. We've, we've been really positive there, so it's about ruling that back out. Um, so we sort of focused on London, but definitely um, it's something that we, we should do so, and, and will be doing going forward. Have you of any successful 
negotiations. Sir. Yeah. Thank you. In your written evidence, you mentioned some of the challenges surrounding increasing the use of rail freight between Daventry and Moss End, as well as using the Highland main, la main line for delivering freight uh, to Inverness and beyond. Can you tell us about these challenges and how you might overcome them? Yeah, and I think it goes back to something I'd, I'd said briefly before, which is around the seven-day railway. Some, some of it's around that. So certainly in terms of looking at the product that we source from our distribution centre at Coventry, which is our slow-moving ambient lines, um, as I say, we've had six, some success in terms of we, we trialled that. We started in 2010 with one container a day. We dipped our toe in the water. That was extremely successful, both from a reliability point of view and, um, you know, we mm. we weren't expecting it to be cheaper than road because we use double deck road trailers, which are significantly efficient. We can get really good fill on those, but um, it wasn't significantly more expensive. So we decided to expand that following the success of the trial. Um, so we now move 25% of that volume from the Midlands to Scotland via rail. And again, the reliability is, is, is generally very, very good. Um, but in terms of the barriers to further expanding that, again, it goes back to this needing to have a consistent service across seven days. So we've actually got a very wide dispatch window and Newhouse of Scotland is actually, in terms of its dispatch window, significantly wider than um, any other distribution centre in the UK. And just, just what I mean by that is if we're dispatching shops that are being delivered in Glasgow or uh, Cope Bridge, for example. We're also dispatching stores that are being delivered to Shetland uh, via ferries. So there's a huge wide dispatch window for product which is dated on a certain day. So ideally, we would have products arriving in a staggered fashion. So, you know, if we have a road trailer, we can actually have a road trailer arriving every two hours. So that'll suit that outbound dispatch. Whereas with rail, um, generally everything arrives at once. So although currently we're, we're doing the, the, the product we choose to move by rail, we're doing that very successfully. In order to expand rail, what we would need to start doing is moving on to, say, two different services running at different times of the day. But again, one of those significant barriers is what do we do on a Saturday evening because we can't run trains at the same time. We do run seven days, and we do run trains on a Sunday late morning, early, af uh, early afternoon, but it's different product. We can't choose the same product day in, day out. And one of the things with grocery distribution is getting some consistency so that the operators can run something that actually makes sense day in, day out. You mentioned also in your written evidence that you'd like to reduce your freight traffic on the A77 by the possibility of using rail to get product to Cairn Ryan for going to Northern Ireland. Uh, you mentioned that this would uh, involve reopening uh, other rail lines. Have you done any study into whether it would be viable for that work to be done? We haven't done a study uh, ourselves, no. So the, essentially it would be up to Parliament and government to consider the broader uh, possibilities of that and take it forward. I, I think. I mean. I think sometimes these things are, are, are led by industry and rail operators. But I think in that instance, it would be useful to have some sort of steer from the Scottish government. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, we, we. In terms of Northern Ireland, it, it it makes sense for us to actually supply Northern Ireland from Scotland. Mm -hmm. um, some of the ranges are shared. But that's not to say we haven't looked in the past at the business case for supplying Northern Ireland from Haitian or Liverpool via our St Helens distribution centre. We've got no plans to do that, but obviously it's one of the things that we look at in terms of what are the economics of supplying Northern Ireland in terms of the range we actually supply there. So it's an option that could be achieved uh, as part of a broader yeah. policy. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Mike, you have some questions? Yes, uh, thank you, convener. Um, and it's, these questions are probably mainly directed to Mr Kirkhope, but um, the, 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 the committees uh, had the opportunity of visiting some uh, 
railheads during the course of its inquiry, and I wondered if you felt that the industry has got enough terminals to allow full access to rail services. Actually, this is a you know a broader question. If 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 the other two gentlemen would like to contribute to this, you may have some uh, insights, but perhaps it's Mr. Kirkhope to start off. Yeah. I mean, I think we face a different challenge to the likes of some of the larger retailers. So I know obviously Tesco run a number of trains up to Inverness, and their facility at Inverness is probably best described as a, a, a concrete base with some lifting equipment. But what Tesco can do, and they have the luxury because of their store profile, they can actually take a container, um, load it onto a train in the central belt, load it onto a, a flatbed, what we call a skelly trailer, at Inverness using that facility, and then deliver it direct to store because it's full loads. Most of their stores are what we call dock level access, which means that there's a purpose built dock. For ourselves, um, our store network is predominantly convenience, a lot of older stores, so a lot of the access is at ground level. So we tend to use vehicles that are, we use almost exclusively vehicles that are fitted with tail lifts. Um, we've also got access issues, so we're using smaller vehicles to deliver into stores and where the likes of Tesco, I use Tesco as an example again, can use a 45-foot container and deliver it direct into store. There's much less of our stores that we can actually deliver on that size of trailer. So I think for us it's about looking at innovations around how we get um, product consolidated. And, and don't get me wrong, we've got a, we've got a what we call a cross-stock centre in Inverness, and that's exactly what that does, but it does it using road double-deckers and we consolidate onto smaller delivery vehicles. Um, but it, it, it might be something that, that takes um, you know, a number of retailers to, 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 to get together you know, in terms of getting a critical mass of volume, but certainly I, I, you know, if, if we were to move a critical mass of volume to rail, I think that could probably make the economics uh, a little bit better. Um, but at the moment, the, the, the least cost option for us is to actually move uh, products to Inverness, for example, using double deck trailers because we can get, get that fill uh, and the economics are right. In, in, in terms of Mr. Barker and Mr. Lionist, in, in terms of the work that you do, um, you know, is there a kind of blockage because of a lack of rail freight terminals or? I think um, there, there is obviously a need for uh, road um, and rail and ferry services to be combined at a certain point in time. Um, and uh, unfortunately, at this point in time in Scotland, we, we at least don't have the opportunity to combine uh, our ferry services with a direct rail connection. Um, and uh, this is, uh, from a competitive point of view, obviously not ideal, but also from an environmental point of view, I think there should be a need, there is a need for uh, for a rail connection at a ferry terminal. And we basically see that in most of the other ports that we operate ourselves. Um, I'm responsible for our terminal in Ghent, for example, in Belgium, uh, where we have, uh, we're now looking at a train service uh, from the southern part of France uh, to connect to uh, the port in Ghent and thereby have a direct connection to the Scandinavian uh, countries. Um, so it's a very strong, um, let's say, product that you can sell if you com can combine a ferry service um, with a, uh, a rail connection, especially uh, if the, the trade is characterized by a lot of container movements, as we see on the Reside service. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, if you, if you look at our, um, again, terminals that we operate uh, within Europe, a lot of them are what I would call truly multimodal or able to get modal shift, so you've got the option of a road, a rail, and a sea option, uh, all contained within one terminal. Um, I think one of the, the, the kind of unique situations that we have in the UK, um, and I say this having come to Unifida from previously working for PD Ports, which was a, a port authority, um, the, the model in the UK is the ports are privately owned. So they are beholden to a shareholder as opposed to a, a statute uh, for the better of the community. Um, obviously, we still have trust ports in the UK, so they're a little bit more, sort of, have more uh, more involvement. And I think that's one of the... In the UK, terminals, port, port terminals are privately owned. You've got elements of rail that is privately owned. And, and it's how you get, to be blunt, two private businesses vying for the same end user to actually cooperate a little bit. Um, that, that's the challenge for all of us, for ourselves as well as, as, as yourselves as, as a government. Thank you.
question. Um, there have been a number of uh, road improvements suggested in written submissions to the committee. Um, I wonder if you could, uh, you know, just consider what you know, how road improvements might impact on your businesses and uh, um, what, what improvements you would, you, you, you would hope to see? I think from our perspective, I mean, I, I think Steen and I go back to the same point that we started with. Our, our kind of product is a, is a time-driven, we have a moment in time to clear that vessel and reload that vessel. So our interaction with the road side of uh, either for a delivery or a collection um, you know, this week is a classic. We've got we've got obviously holiday this week, so I've got m a lot of the distilleries actually trying to get as many boxes to me before the vessel leaves. Because if it doesn't leave, it's another week or two or three days. So for, from our kind of passive view of the road network, is that ability to to kind of have the major arterial routes in and out of the port, and being blunt, in and out of the rail terminals, as free and as accessible as possible um, because we're all driven by, you know, as I say to people, the vessel leaves and if the containers aren't on or the trailers aren't on and it's the worst thing in the world to see someone drive onto a terminal just to see the vessel leave because it's all, all, all the action of everyone has failed. Mm. I've experienced the same thing as a passenger. No, <laughs> What Paul said, I mean, we, in, in our written submission, we'd actually mentioned the A801 between Grangemouth and um, Bathgate. Um, now, that's, I think that the, the, the basis of our submission was around stores we service in the Falkirk, Grangemouth and Burness area, but uh, also the, the rain, rail terminal at Grangemouth, uh, where our trains come into on a weekend, but there's a number of the, the, the big retailers also moving trains into Grangemouth. Um, I think I think that A eight oh one completion would would be a, a worthwhile sort of missing link, certainly in the central belt. Uh, that's that's certainly one of them. Um, we mentioned before the A eighty three. I think it's just about keeping focus on making that resilient as possible. And um, we do understand that Scotland has significant challenges in terms of the geography and the weather. Um, but again, it's just about making sure that any road schemes are as weatherproof as possible. Really. Um, it's, it's the resilience that, that's, that's the key for us. And as I say, we, we, we certainly welcome the A9. Um, we, we, you know, we've seen some significant improvements due to the M74 extension, for example, and hopefully the, the M8 work and the work around the junctions linking the M73 um, should make things a lot better as well in terms of those pinch points. And my um, final question really is about uh, road equivalent tariff. Um, you mentioned that, Mr. Kirkhope, in your uh, in your submission. Um, have you had uh, any discussions with the Scottish government about road equivalent tariff for freight? We haven't yet. Um, we've put it in our submission, and we would welcome further discussions on it. And I think, you know, obviously it's a step in the right direction. But we see if if that could be applied to freight and larger goods vehicles. Um, even on a sort of gradual scale, then we see that as a, an advantage in terms of us being able to um, more accurately differentiate in terms of prices of ferries between operators and that sort of thing. So, so we, we, we would welcome further discussions on that. And just finally, sorry, uh, with your indulgence again, convener, um, on the, the Northern Isles routes, I've had discussions with uh, um, road haulers and so on, who seem to be pretty pleased with the service that CERCO are providing there. Would, would, you, would you go along? You mentioned you have a store in, in, in Lerwick, I think, in Shetland. Yeah, we do. We have a store in Lerwick. We, we use um, a local haulier, Shetland Transport, actually do our distribution to that, to that store, and the reliability has been generally good. Okay, thank you. Mr Van Ness, you talked about the, um, the challenges around lack of investment in our port terminals, and Mr Barker, you, you've talked about the barriers to achieving uh, multimodal operations within a, a single terminal. How much, and particularly given your experience operating across um, a variety of different countries and legal jurisdictions, how much of a barrier to achieving the investment and the multimodal operations that you would like do you think the private ownership of the ports is at the moment? 
Um, I speak with two heads here, my current one and my previous one. Um, I think it, it, it is markedly different um, when you see a private port model as opposed to what I would term as a municipal one. Um, I think there are benefits and curses for both. Um, you know, we deal with some municipal, as I would call them, terminals, which are not particularly astoundingly good. Um, I, I think what we've tried to do with the terminals in the UK, and I mean, we, we obviously call five up and down the East Coast, is is really to try and push them to to invest and to, to move with us. Um, I don't think I can honestly say whether if it was a municipal model, would it be any quicker in investing than a private model? I, I, I'm not sure whether something passes through a, a governmental process quicker than it does through a boardroom process. Um, I think it comes down, whichever model, to an appetite to invest. Um, it, because ultimately there's a, there's a return to be made from it. Yeah. yeah, I can only agree with this. Um, I, I think we, we operate a number of terminals ourselves where either the landlord uh, is uh, the municipality uh, or it's privately owned, like we have in, in our Immingham facility where ABP is the, uh, the owner of the terminal uh, or owner of the land. Um, uh, I think a private party would, would, would look at the business case and say, okay, is this something that we are willing to invest in? Uh, but the business case is always based on assumptions. Uh, and I think you can either make a, let's say, a, a low risk investment and say, I need to have a business case and a customer and a plan to operate this, or I'm willing to make an investment for the future and actually um, see if I can then attract uh, cargo or customers to it. Um, so I don't, I don't know whether there's any difference in, in, in a state owned or a municipality owned terminal or a privately owned. Being across the, the different jurisdictions that you operate, because you it, it's a mix. Uh, it, it's not as good in the UK as they are in other. Uh, yeah, for example, the terminal that we operate in uh, in Gothenburg, it's actually it was owned by the municipality of Gothenburg, and it was sold to uh, the the container terminal was sold to a private party. Uh, the railroad terminal was sold to ourselves. Um, and uh, we then take a, a different look at investing in that. But again, we take a certain risk in that as well. And I think it, in the end, as a private company, it, it depends on the number and, and, and the level of risk that you're willing to take. Um, and uh, I think there's a, there's a clear uh, advantage of having someone that is operating the terminal to also have a direct link with the customers or even being the customer themselves. Uh, because then, of course, the level of risk that you're willing to take is obviously higher. Mr. Kirkhope, do you have a, a view? No. Okay, in that case, we'll move on. Is, is, not, is the issue not um, the lack of competition uh, that you pointed out earlier, the fact that the fourth ports operate <coughs> essentially a monopoly mm -hmm. on your part of your part of Scotland, part of Scotland you want to uh, you want to use? Is that not the issue? I think, I think it is. It it is, it is very obvious that there's the choice is singular. Um, I think the the stance that we would take was, yes, we would welcome competition, but would the competition be equal to, better than, or less than what we've currently got? Um, and I think it, that then comes back to uh, the level of investment or risk. That a new player in the market would uh, would would be willing to take. Um, certainly, if a new terminal came along and it was it was it could give us the the, the the throughput that we benchmark against. Yes, we would consider it, whether it be private or or municipal. You know, we, we have no no view one way or the other. But the the competition on the east coast, on particularly in in on the east coast of Scotland, is is singular. There is no competition. Um, I can't say how good the competition would be because I'm not sure who it would be and what they would offer. Um. I think to add to this point, I mean, there is, uh, from our perspective, there obviously is a certain level of competition available on the East Coast, um, but it's not in Scotland. Uh, and we have been evaluating T-Sport as an alternative, and we were very close in actually moving our business to T-Sport. Uh, and this would have added uh, 40,000 units on the road that need to go into Scotland. Um, so the competition is clearly there, and the alternative is there. Uh, we couldn't come to commercial terms, but uh, from a let's say um, commercial point of view, 
the terminal at T-Sport is, uh, is much more beneficial for us than the terminal on the side. Scottish government or, uh, should have a look at the, the operation um, that you're talking about to try and, uh, and encourage improvement. I think if if there if there is a uh, an aim to grow the the general economy and and the commerce of Scotland, um, then yes, I would advocate looking at a range of options. I mean. It, our customers um, are very much very focused on, on a very singular item. They have a point of origin and a point of destination. And from origin to destination, it's driven by two pretty brutal facts. One is cost and one is time. And they will make a decision based on the mode of transport that fits either or both of those criteria. So I think to actually have... Um, more options in Scotland. You know, the the optimist says yes, it'll 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 be uh, it'll 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 increase trade. The pessimist says, well, it might. Um, but I think you know, for a growing economy, to give it as many options to to trade, you know, is 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 obviously a positive. I think to illustrate this with a, with a small example, we, uh, we have three automotive customers on our ferry service. We have Mercedes, uh, Mazda and Ford. Uh, there's obviously more cars that are being sold in Scotland than these three brands. Um, and this is an illustration of uh, a lot of the automotive customers choosing for uh, ports that are further down south and actually moving it on the road to Scotland. So any of the cars that you see driving around that are not either of these three, would have come to uh, to a port uh, further south, being T-Sport, uh, Immingham, or anything on the Humber. Um, so you see the number of miles that this adds to uh, to the road network. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Dave, you have some questions? Thank, thank you. Peter, could I keep on the theme of ports um, and ask maybe some more specific points? You, you probably are aware that the committee has visited a number of ports uh, during the investigation, such as um, Aberdeen, uh, Rotterdam and Grangemouth. Um, James Storn and I visited Rotterdam just last week and as we'll know at one time it was the largest port in the world, it's now the eighth largest, uh, it's the largest in Europe. Although if I'm being pedantic I would argue that the seven Chinese ports above in the league table have a different criteria and involve inland port activity as well but perhaps that's been a bit too pedantic even for, even for me. Um, do you believe that there is sufficient ports in Scotland in terms of both number and in terms of quality? And the other aspect I was really fascinated about was that Rotterdam basically made the argument to me when we asked some questions about, you know, why are you so successful? And basically that point is 99% of the reason we're successful is location um, because of the, the ideal location in the centre of Europe they're at. The other key point is that uh, they believe that infrastructure development is absolutely vital. For example, the development of a specific freight rail at which they have developed. So I'll just give you one example before I ask you to answer, is they said that uh, boats would steam past Italy uh, to get to Rotterdam to deliver goods by rail from Rotterdam to Italy because it's more efficient to do it that way. It's not just about providing the port, but all the infrastructure of what they call the hinterland. Do you agree with the analysis from Rotterdam? I think I would, again, put my old hat on. What I used to say to people when I, when I work for Port Authority is the great strength of the Port Authority, but its biggest weakness is it will never move. It's pretty fixed. You know, the co-op can, can see their, their, their kind of customer trend move and they can actually rejig their network to move. With the port, it is all about the location. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the things that, that certainly that I advocated when I worked in the sector was there is an, a, an obligation on the port to actually work with the region. You know, it's an enabler mm. um, to to commerce. <coughs> and I think I would always say that more competition is not always better, but it certainly is better when there's a monopoly position. Mm. You know, it, at the moment it's it's a, you know it, it's a one it's a one horse race, and that that will be constricted by the appetite of the operator to take risk or no risk mm -hmm. because the choice is singular you know mm -hmm. it's i mean my biggest frustration with 
with Grange Mouth as an example, is they have a historic working pattern that between a certain time on a Saturday evening and a certain time on a Sunday morning, they don't work. So they're 24-7, they're six and three quarters a hmm. days. Could you ask a sort of sensitive issue? Are they meant to be working, or is it still? <laughs> well, <laughs> and you, you have this great situation of saying, "Well, hang on," you know. They say, "Well, we're a twenty-four-seven pot." You're <clears throat> not, because you have this gap. Right. Why, why can you not? You know. And I think if you, if I use the example of, of I mean, we do a lot in and out of Rotterdam, is their approach has very been much that we will provide infrastructure, and it will naturally. Mm. be a magnet for trade mm. um, and, and I think you know in the UK the port models because they're private are mm. more mm. circumspect in their investment mm. it's like prove to me I am going to get this return before I will mm. do it you know I always use the term that the, the British port sector doesn't use the Kevin Costner school of build it and they will come, come and if yeah. anyone's you seen the film Feel the Dreams you're then you're taking the words out of my mouth yeah um, and whilst the port it doesn't move by, by definition what was interesting I think in Rotterdam is as you know it's owned by the city um, but they have great independence. But what they have done is developed phenomenally from the infrastructure around about the port. Um, they've developed phenomenally in terms of crane development and, and uh, the size of the port. Um, and, of course, the, you know, the freight rail, is specific only freight line, is a phenomenal example of building infrastructure. Yeah. I think what you've got to do with any port, and, and I will be critical of, of, of the UK port sector, is... is it is not as developed as creating a port community, mm. which is a combination of, you know, the, a municipality, private, the freight sector, and the manufacturing and service sector. Mm. You know, I mean, if if I look at you know my 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 time with PD, you know, one of the things that that we managed to do, which was which was reasonably uh, a, a, a first in the industry, was to get retailers to build a facility on the port. So that the first point of intervention was at the port, mm -hmm. um, but again, being brutally honest, that was done very much on a mm. will Asda and Tesco pay me enough to mm. build this? Yes, we will do it. If they'd have said, "Well, will you build something and we might use it?" we'd have mm. said no. Mm -hmm. So I think it's 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 the appetite to invest and the appetite to create a community. Which you know what Rotterdam have done is they've they've crossed across modal types. Mm. They're as comfortable with sea as road as rail. Mm. Unfortunately, we still have a model that has three competing, competing mm. disciplines, mm. and and that's they're always uneasy bedfellows. Mm. I, I think you're right. Certainly, if I recall, when we took evidence from the ports, and it was more than just four, we, um, we asked about rail, and I certainly got the, the feeling that we said, well, effectively, rail's competition rather than being part of a so part of a wider package. Would you agree on that? I think, yeah, I would. I would. I think it it is perceived as you know, uh, as a as a an adversarial relationship as opposed to a cooperative one. Mm. Thank you, Mr. Van Esk. Yeah, I think Rotterdam is actually an interesting example. Uh, I'm from the Netherlands myself, and I've worked yeah. in the port of Rotterdam I as well. I guess. Uh, yes, <laughs> um, and and I think pr uh, to the previous discussion that we had on on private and 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 uh, and. Um, public ownership of, of ports, uh, I think it again is down to a level of risk that you're willing to take. If you take the port of Rotterdam, they, they've taken a significant or an enormous risk actually by developing the second mass flakte, which is a huge facility to, uh, to operate. Um, um, and uh, on the one hand, you could argue that it's maybe not the best risk that they've taken because some of the land is, is still available for, for a commercial party to operate. At the same time, of course, they have been able through this investment that they've made to attract a lot of customers to it. Um, and I think it's a combination of the two that you need to have. You need to have a, a close partnership with uh, with the commercial parties that are then the ones that are operating the services into your into your port, uh, and at the same time uh, a degree of risk that you're willing to take to make such a, an investment. Mm. Thank you for that, Mr. Kirkwood. Um, I, I haven't really we haven't really got a, a major view on this. I mean, in terms of. Um, you know, imports from the Far East, for example, we tend to handle those through our distribution centre in Coventry because we have the facilities to de-stuff containers. That's where you've got containers that are filled from floor to mm. ceiling to maximise fill. Um, but we very much leave it up to our suppliers in terms of those imports as to which ports they're coming into, um, given the volume that we're actually uh, pulling in, you know, non-food versus food, for example. Mm. 
Thank you for that. Um, I'm conscious of time, Commissioner, just a couple of quick points. Um, do you believe there's a case um, or a demand for a deep water port in Scotland? Mr. Barker. Um, I think the difficulty with a deep water port is its ability to attract. Again, I used my previous experience in Teesport. Our model was to, when I worked for PD, was, was, to, was to look at uh, being a, a direct call port. And what happened, and we're seeing happen now, is particularly in the, uh, in the container sector, is the, the vessels are getting ever bigger. And you either build something that is oversized <coughs> for the largest now, or you run the risk of marginalising yourself in a particular sector. Um, I think, from my perspective, and you might say I might say this, what's needed in Scotland is, is some very strong feeder ports that can pick up from Hamburg and Rotterdam. You mm. know, I if there could be a situation that there was there was an option in Scotland um, to to have um, good facilities that would would feed off Hamburg and Rotterdam and Felixstowe. I mean, you know, we we move a huge amount of cargo from Felixstowe into Grangemouth um, and vice versa. Um, so I think my answer to your question would be deep but not massively deep. I think stick for the stick for the feeder. I think it's a it's a branch line as opposed to a main line if I can mm -hmm. mix my metaphors. Um, you know, a good branch line would be better than a main line. Okay. Oh, Mr. Van Ness? I think from my perspective uh, I would agree. Uh, and I think if you would copy the model of T Sport and you will put it in uh, somewhere in, on the east coast of Scotland, you come very close to something that is actually suitable for, for the Scottish trade. Uh, it's, a, it's a feeder port, uh, it has container operations, it has railroad facilities as well, uh, and I think that would actually be suitable for, uh, for Scotland as such. Mm -hmm. Mr. Kakko? Mm -hmm. I, I don't, th don't think we have a, a, a major view in terms of the ports. I mean, obviously, if there's a benefit to the local community and, and our, you know, our local customers and members in terms of reduced carbon, reduced travel time from the port to the end destination, then that's obviously a positive thing all around. Mm -hmm. okay, um, my final question, Queen, is um, how well, in your view, is the Zeiss to Zebra Go ferry service operate? Mr. Barker? So, I, I didn't get a question. Could you repeat? Uh, yeah. Huh? How well does the Rousseau uh, ferry service to the mainland of Europe operate, in your view? Well, there's different ways of looking at it. From a financial point of view, not very well. Uh, yeah. And uh, as you are aware, we, uh, we've signed a memorandum of understanding with the Scottish Government and with Fourth Ports, where we looked at the, uh, uh, primarily at the finances of the route. Um, the route is loss-making. So from a DFDS perspective, um, if, if this situation continues, there is no further interest to continue operating this route. Right. purely from a financial point of view. Um, we have tried to, uh, to, in this memorandum of understanding with the Scottish Government and with Fort Ports, uh, find a solution for this. And, and there's a, a number of different scenarios that are on the table at the moment. Uh, we're looking at uh, purchasing a new built vessel, which would then be financed by, uh, by the Scottish Government. And this is one of the things that, uh, that is on the table, and we're very interested and, and very eager to, uh, to find a solution for this. Uh, if we just look at our own financial perspective, uh, we at this point in time do not see a, uh, yeah, a very long uh, future for the route if it continues like this. Um, yeah, we are a commercial company as well and eventually our shareholders will also start asking questions why we operate a service that is continuously loss making and has been loss making since 2008 when we started operating this route. Mm. Um, how can it be improved? Um, well, there's a couple of things that we agreed in the Memorandum of Understanding, and, and since it's a confidential document, I can't really provide all the details since it's also a public hearing, of course. Uh, but there's a number of things that we agreed uh, with Fort Ports uh, in terms of infrastructure adjustments, um, and those would need to take effect. Um, and again, this is similar to the discussion that we had previously. They, uh, uh, they argued that uh, one of the clauses in the MOU is that uh, the board needs to give an approval for it. So obviously they look at this as a business case and they uh, want a long-term commitment from ourselves and from the Scottish Government that the service will be there, which to a certain extent is understandable. At the same time, of course, this is what we agreed in the MOU and has not materialized. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and this would allow, enable the current vessel to, to have double stack containers on the, uh, on the main or on the weather deck. Uh, and this would basically add additional volume to the route. Uh, so that's one thing. 
the second thing is that we need to look at a more sustainable solution for the f for the service and for the ferry itself. As you know, we, we are faced with uh, some new sulfur regulations that, uh, mm -hmm. that require us to burn a different type of fuel since the 1st of January this year. <coughs> and this has added a lot of cost to our, to our service. Uh, our fuel is approximately 40% of our cost base. Um, and the additional cost uh, or the change, the difference in bunker prices um, has, uh, has moved the bunker from let's say 600 as it was to 900. So our, our bunker prices has increased with, uh, with 50%, uh, and this is 40% of our total cost price. And we've not necessarily been able to retrieve this from our customer base. So the finances that I described before uh, are even more difficult at this point in time. Um, mm. So we need to find a solution, and within our fleet, in the rest of our network, we actually have a number of different solutions, like a, uh, a scrubber installation that washes the sulfur out of the emissions. Um, and this could be a potential investment that, uh, that we're also looking at, and this is one of the scenarios that we're now also investigating together with Transport Scotland. Thank you. That's very helpful. Do any other of the witnesses wish to add any comments? I think I would. I would say that, you know, from, from my perspective, I believe that, that the service we offer needs a counter, there needs to be another offering. I think I, I kind of step back and look at it from a, from, a, from a Scottish economic point of view of cargo in and cargo out. As I said earlier on, you know, our clients are the same as, as, as DFDS's where they're looking at an end-to-end -end solution. And within that, they will have a price and a time. And I can only offer one price and one time. So I would rather have a strong competitor who can counterplay what we do so that the, uh, t to be blunt, the flows continue and prosper rather than wither on the vine because there is just one player. You know, if, if I use, use the fourth part analogy, I don't think us being the only player on the East Coast in the Grange Mouth is a good thing. Mm. And that might be strange to say, but it's a fact. I can see our customers who actually, you know, we are both customers of each other. You know, we, sh we share terminals, we carry their cargo, they carry ours. So there is a need for that synergy. And I think, you know, from our perspective, we would like to see a very strong competitor on in Scotland because it's good for all of us. Thank you for that. Mr Kirkle, have you anything to add? Mm. Right. Thank you, Computer. James, you have some questions? Thank you, you know, some of them have already been answered in the, in the last few questions. But uh, And Mr Van Est, you, you talked about the impact of the SICA reg regulations. Mr. Barker, do you have anything to add to the comments Mr. Van Es made? Exactly the same. I mean, you know, we, we you know, the vessels that we operate are, are very similar to the DFDS. We've seen it, it, it hit us hard. Um, customers are basically saying, why? We don't want to pay it. We don't recognise it. We don't have to do this. Um, and, and it's a difficult battle. Um, you know, we took the simple view that it, it was not a... It wasn't by our choice. It was it was imposed on us, granted, for one would argue valid reasons. Um, but nevertheless, I go back to my point: time and cost, and this significantly impacts on cost. So you know, people are looking at at the, their freight routes and saying, "Well, hang on, if this is going to go up by X, and I can do it by trailer coming into." Felix Doe or Immingham and bring it up by road and it's cheaper, I'll do it. So it's in some ways it's counterproductive because it's not as clear it's not a clear tax for everybody. It's it's seen in isolation as a marine uh, imposed tax. Would the drop in oil price have made up for it in any way? A little bit but again it, it still is a significant uh, impact on us. And how would you see this situation developing over the months and years? At the moment, it's a battle. Try and be a bit happier than that, Mr. Bar. Yeah, I know. At the moment, it's a, it's a difficult battle because it's it, you know we are actually going to customers and saying, "Hey, guys, this isn't us. You know, this is we have nowhere to go with this, um, and it, it's it's a long road." Um, I think one of the things that, in hindsight. I would have liked to have seen, and this is a personal view, not 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 the view of, of <coughs> Unifida, maybe, is that if the SECA came in, that there was already a mechanism to, of a basis of calculus of when it moves, because at the moment we are getting compared to road, and they're saying, well, road diesel is cheaper, and they have the Platts average or whatever. There isn't there isn't that mechanism that <coughs> was built in from the beginning. 
So in hindsight, if, if it had been brought in with some method of measurement, either up or down, uh, it would have been slightly better. And is there any discussion, do you know, going on with the European Union about? Not that we're aware of. I mean, basically, it's it's in now. It's the the genie is out the bottle, and we are having active, vigorous discussions with our customers. Shall I say? Yeah, okay. Thanks very much, Mr. Van Esten. Yeah. To answer your last question, I think it's actually the European Union is not the right place to address this because it's the IMO that has rectified this, and that means that all the member states of the IMO, the International Maritime Organization, need to rectify this. So, uh, you will have countries in uh, like Mexico, for example, that also need to. Uh, let's say, except that we wouldn't implement this. So um, the FDS has always taken a stance since 2009, actually, that, uh, that this is there to come. And uh, we have also, at that point in time, started making investigations in the scrubber installation, as I explained previously. So we did some tests, and, and they've been very successful. So this is one way of, uh, of uh, let's say, um, counteracting some of the additional costs that you would have. Um, it is a significant investment that, uh, that you need to take. A uh, scrubber installation on board a vessel costs something like between four and seven million euros. Um, and uh, obviously this eventually also needs to be paid back by the customer base as well. Uh, so one way or another, it will add cost to the system. Uh, that being said, the SECA regulations are there, of course, for public health. And, and I think we, we can all agree that, that uh, it's very valid that the, this, uh, these have been imposed. Um, there's a lot of things you can say about the SECA regulation, but uh, uh, the downside for this, let's say the Scottish industry as such, is obviously that um, with the trade on the continent, uh, we're in a sort of a peripheral situation where, of course, the, the Scottish route is, is impacted the most. Um, as I explained previously, the, the turnaround time is, is very short. Uh, the time at sea is very long. Um, and it means that uh, we basically, most of our time, burn fuel. Um, and, and thereby, we are hit the hardest uh, of any of the short sea routes uh, in, in Europe, basically. Um, yeah. So that's, that's unfortunately the consequence of these, uh, these new regulations. Okay, thanks very much. Mr Kirkhope, do you have any comment? Uh, no. No, right, thank you. Uh, are there any other regulatory or policy obstacles to the free flow of sea freight into Scotland? Can I take that as a no? Right, right the, my, my last question is, is there anything which other European countries do to encourage and sustain sea freight which might be replicable in Scotland? And particularly to encourage... Uh, freight into Scotland as opposed to maybe the ports further down south? I think again, I think it, it, for me, it's, it's, it's engendering this port community approach where there's a, there's a kind of, <coughs> there's a bit of cohesion, you know, that the port isn't seen as, you know, I mean, I, again, I go back to my time at, at, at PD Ports where, you know, and, and I find it quite amusing that I talk to local industries in and around the Tees. And they'd say to me, oh, are you based in the Kremlin? Because I used to live in the... I used to have... My office was in the port office, which was an old Victorian port building. And it was red. So locally, it was known as the Kremlin. So that painted the picture to me of the relationship. We were, a, we were a, an authority as opposed to a partner. And I think the big thing that, that, that we certainly try to do with all our terminals um, and even our competitors in terminals is engender that... We have an answer to a certain set of problems, but we don't have them all. You might, so how do we, how do we get that to work? And I think that's one thing that, that dare I say, may be a bit lacking in, in, in fourth ports. Okay, thank you, Mr. Van I think from an infrastructure point of view, there's, there's obviously the things that we already previously discussed that you could, uh, could be involved in. Um, Direct funding or, or subsidizing uh, services is very difficult, and that's also what we notice ourselves now uh, in, in the MOU that we've signed. Uh, we have applied for de minimis funding, and that's basically all that we can get. Uh, obviously, there's good reasons for this. I mean, we, we wouldn't want to have unfair competition either as compared to our, our counterparts in, that operate, for example, on the T-Sport service. Um, so, so I think if there's anything that the Scottish Government can do is, is on the infrastructure side and facilitate this uh, for, for a number of, um, let's say, commercial companies to, to then uh, operate services in and out of Scotland. And I think, I mean, I explained it before, that there is much more cargo flowing than what we jointly carry um, in and out of Scotland. So uh, there clearly is a case uh, for other 
companies to operate services in and out of Scotland uh, and use a maritime service rather than uh, uh, road, for example. So why then, uh, if, if, if there's all that extra business that, that's, that's out there, why are, is there not more of it coming to the East Coast, for example? Unfortunately, it's cost-related. And uh, uh, like my colleague already explained, there's, uh, you have cost and you've got time. And, uh, and time-wise, we can definitely compete uh, with self-drives using the Channel Tunnel. Uh, but it is cost-related. And uh, I mean, we don't have to delve into the subject of Eastern European drivers uh, driving all the way up to Scotland. But, but it is the case. And, and it's, at this point in time, very cheap to, uh, to have a truck driving all the way from France, boulogne sur mer for example, uh, to Scotland. Uh, instead of using um, a maritime link anywhere. Okay. I think as well as there's, there's, you've got the situation that there, there is a finite capacity on, on a marine solution. Um, and you do get into this chicken and egg. Is you say, well, if you put more capacity on, would you get more cargo? The answer is I'm not sure, because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's getting people to, to make that transition from, you know, look, I need it there in six days, so if I don't, you know, the difference between ours is quite obvious. You know, if, if we've got something going into northern Germany and it, it misses the service, the next time it's a week from now. So if, if, a, if a shipper can hit that service, great. If he can't, he'll actually send it by truck to Immingham and put it on DFDS to go to Cuxhaven because he can do it. He, he, he gets back into his time frame. And I think that's the sort of the balance um, you know, I think the for me, if if there was an option out of Scotland that give more frequency and certainty, there would be a natural take up. Um, just because it's easier, you know. I don't think anyone thinks it's great fun to say, right, I'm going to load something in Glasgow, and by the way, I'm going to send it to Dover to make its transit into Europe. And nobody sets out with that view, I don't think. Um, but unfortunately, the fact is. That is their choice, and it's it's a cost and time calculation. You know, their their option to you know to to, to choose other services is is limited. Uh, okay. Equally, it is for us. You know. Okay. Oh, all right. Thanks very much. That's questions. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Kentina. Could I ask uh, Mr. Kirkhope? Um, in your written submission, you pointed out that you've been successful in, in shifting freight. Uh, from road to rail. You say there was over 10,000 tonnes of freight have been moved off the road ne network. Uh, and you also uh, flag up that that was partly due to the fact you were able to, to access mode shift or revenue support scheme. Um, was this an easy process for you to, to achieve? In of that traffic, yes, because that grant was actually um, administered through WH Malcolm Group. Right. So Malcolm Group, on our behalf, claim back that MSRS, right. and then we get the benefit of the of the rate. So I think in terms of the direct discussion between ourselves and the government, there wasn't there wasn't the need for that because okay. Malcolms were able to claim that themselves. <coughs> But you have been, you have made approaches to the Scottish government to, to access this grant, and you haven't been so uh, for other developments, and you haven't been so successful. Could uh, you maybe explain what's going on there? Yeah, I think I think to clarify that point, and we'd said in the written submission that there that, that had been some um, issues. I think just to clarify, we we were looking at moving some goods onto rail um, for Inverness traffic. So that's goods that are currently using the A9. And we approached the Russell Group, um, who were looking, again on our behalf, looking at the possibilities of moving some freight onto rail. So Russell's actually made the approach on our behalf to the Scottish Government um, around MSRS, but also, I think, freight facilities grants at the time. Um, and I think that the, they came back to us and gave us the indication that the, that the Scottish Government were minded to give further grants on that particular route, Central Belt to Inverness. So that's where that was, just to sort of clarify, and I know we put that in our written submission, but it was actually through Russell's that we'd made that application or, or uh, expression of interest. 
But uh, okay, th there was a no uh, in the response that came back the, uh, for that. But you would recommend the use of these this particular uh, scheme as a, a good one. I think so. I think anything that can make rail uh, economical, as I mean, one one thing we look at all the time. Yes, we want to do the right thing. We'd like to move things, remove goods and freight onto rail, hmm. but not at any expense. Hmm. So anything that brings the playing fields a little bit more level in terms of road and rail has got to be welcomed, whether that be in terms of facilities. Um, and I think the definition of facilities perhaps is quite uh, maybe slightly too narrow because I don't think it allows us to invest in things like containers, specialised containers or um, flatbed skelly trailers as we would call them. So I think that the definition of, uh, of facilities is uh, maybe a little bit narrower than, than, than we would like. So you'd recommend us reviewing that, that area? I think that would be good. Available. Yeah. I, I think that, yeah, I think that would be good. Okay. No, for, sorry. Okay. That, sorry, come here. Just a very quick uh, supplementary. Um, I was a bit surprised to find there wasn't any successful freight facility grant award since 2011, <laughs> although there was for waterborne grants. I can't understand a view that says we don't want any more uh, applications to take freight off road onto, onto rail, uh, because clearly that's a huge problem on, on the A9. However, we b there is a huge problem which is identified in your report, which is there are height restrictions on that route. There is also uh, two thirds of the route is single track. So effectively, uh, there is maybe some concerns there, but I still don't understand the view that says <laughs> there's a freight facility grant, but we don't want any more for this crucial route where the A9 is congested with HGVs and requires to, to get a change round, not, not least for climate change. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I, I don't know what the politics were around that, you know, the, <coughs> that negative response. Again, as I say, it wasn't an approach we made directly. Um, mm. I, I certainly think there's an opportunity in that sort of Inverness area for, a, for a, um, not just the sort of concrete pad that, that maybe the likes mm. of Tesco are using, but some sort of... Um, facility that can maybe consolidate inbound orders from the Highlands mm. and, and, and obviously uh, mm. from Central Belt as well. So yeah, I think there's opportunities there. We're very interested in consolidation centres, but I'll perhaps let James Dorman take the glory for that. <laughs> Thank you. As a politician, obviously, I'm always happy to take the glory for anything, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm not convinced that it was all my doing. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's just that they just touching on, on what David said there. The, we had hauliers in front of us who said that there was no issue with applying for uh, the grants at all. That part of the, part of the reason that the, the money wasn't given out was that either people hadn't applied for them or they'd applied for them inappropriately, but they didn't seem to think that there was an issue in getting them. I can only take the, the feedback we'd had from, from Russell's on that particular approach, and that, that's what sort of led to us making that comment. So, you know, just on that one experience, I think, you know... And perhaps that's a, a lesson all around in terms of having direct contact with Scottish Government or, ourselves and, and, and in, you know, a two-way communication, which is you know, certainly welcome. Can I ask the, the, the shipping lines, have you seen any evidence of, of freight grant schemes helping to shift freight away from road to rail or indeed to, to, sea, uh, to sea freight? Um, and if you if you have, how might these schemes be be further developed? From our perspective, certainly into Scotland, we've not seen any, or we've not had any approaches. Um, if I can give an example of something that we've done uh, in 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 England, is we're now working with a, uh, one of the major retailers who was pr traditionally bringing deep sea exports into Felixstowe, and their delivery was the north of England. And they were they were previously moving them from Felixstowe by road up into the northeast. We now move them from Felixstowe to Teesport by sea. And we're actually actively pushing our um, customers to to consider, can we do the same for Grangemouth? Can we do the same for uh, Immingham? Um, now that's driven really by doggedness on our part rather than any access to grants. So um, I must admit my ignorance to the availability of grants is huge. Right. I, I know nothing <laughs> <laughs> on that front, right. certainly in Scotland. Right. Okay. I know a little bit more about it. Um, 
we uh, within DFDS we have successfully applied uh, or um, received uh, funding from uh, the TNT program, uh, the European program. Mm -hmm. Um, this in relation and connection with the uh, scrubber installations that we've had on board uh, a number of our vessels. Um, the TNT program obviously characterizes itself by having infrastructural investments that are also required on both ends of the port. Uh, so uh, ideally you need to do this where you, uh, where you in some sort of a way also influence yourself in the port operation. Um, so we've successfully applied for that. Uh, we've obviously had the waterborne freight grant uh, for the Reside service in 2009, I believe. Um, and uh, we have now received the de minimis funding. Um, we, in the MOU, have also uh, um, identified a marketing match fund uh, that could be applied to the, uh, to the marketing spend that we have on the service. Um, but other than that, I think that the majority of the uh, funds available would come through the European institutions, uh, such as the motorways of the seas in the past, the Marco Polo program, um, and of course now the TNT program. Um, and this obviously requires that there is uh, a corridor that is being identified and that, uh, that we can apply uh, our route or routes going into Scotland within a certain corridor that is being identified by the European institutions. Right. So th potentially, do you think they, they, they could, they could um, affect your business and uh, um, help, help trade these access to these kind of schemes? I think anything that, 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 that you know, I think I go back to my time and cost. Anything that impacts on either of those positively will be will be taken up um, in a in a structured way. I think positively. I, I think it's um, one of the important things that you've seen with the motorways of the seas is that a lot of routes that have been started with the motorways of the seas funding have actually ceased operation after the funding run out. Mm. Um, and and it's from our perspective uh, a ferry service that you would operate you would operate for a longer period than just the motorways of the seas funding uh, and um, I don't think that it's a very healthy situation that uh, but it's a personal point of view that that we should s uh, subsidize ferry routes across Europe um, of course if there's certain infrastructure investments that you need to do and undertake and, and you can switch um, uh, have a m achieve a modal shift and of course it would be interesting to look at it but I think in general, ferry services need to be able to sustain itself also uh, for the long term and not just for the funding period. Okay. It's certainly the model that, that we use right across Unifida, both in Northern Europe and Southern Europe. We will base our decision on the service based on its sustainability as a standalone, right. rather than, hey, we can have a crutch for six months and we'll hope and pray that we can wean ourselves off that. Right. But, but your experience, Mr. Kirkcourt, was that... You did manage to, via the, the, the grant funding, you did manage to make a, a sustainable shift away from, from the, the road to rail, that, that, that in the longer run uh, you can do without uh, any subsidy. I think that the, the subsidy that we received for the product that's coming from the Midlands to um, Central Belt Scotland that helped make the business case viable because obviously we're always looking at ways of improving the cost and efficiency of what we do. Um, we were running on double deck road trailers. So that bit of grant just made that difference to make the business case worthwhile. As I say, we, know, we, knew, we knew it wasn't going to be any cheaper to move product by rail. It's definitely the right thing to do from an environmental point of view. But as a business, we can't afford to invest unlimited amounts of money in actually moving to a different mode of transport um, because we, at the end of the day, we need to be a successful business um, first and foremost. However, I say that that MSRS bit that is claimed on our behalf by Malcolm's um, has made the difference in terms of making that a viable operation or it being too costly for us. So. Just uh, to clarify, did that subsidise the transition, or is that an ongoing subsidy? I, I believe it's an ongoing subsidy. Um, it's sort of reflected in the container rate that we pay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Mr. Kirkhope, um, I understand that 25% of your freight, that in terms of the Scottish market, is transported by rail from Durft and Daventry to Moss End. What would be the specific measures, and you've, you've talked about the, the grant schemes that are available, what specific measures would you want this committee 
to recommend to the Scottish Government that would help bring about a greater increase in that percentage? Well, I think, first of all, just to clarify, we're actually moving 25% of what we call slow-moving grocery. So we have a national distribution centre at Coventry, um, and that supplies a percentage of our ambient grocery offer. Um, so we have local offer, uh, which is some of its regional specific, which is held at our um, distribution centres locally, so say Newhouse, and we have the slow moving lines which are moved up from, from Coventry. So 25% of that slow moving line is moved. Just, just, to, just to clarify that, it's not all product coming from, from England that's, that's, that 25% refers to. Um, I think in terms of improving that um, or increasing that percentage, um, I think one of the points I've made previously around the seven-day railway, that, that is critical in terms of being able to make that next step at the current rates um, because we do, we do need to be able to move similar stores and similar volumes across a 24-7 period. That's important to us. Um, I think anything that can actually bring down the cost as well in terms of not just using that grant but also um, the ability to have longer trains which means that the individual container cost is brought down. I mean uh, I must admit we, we work closely with uh, WH Malcolm Group. Um, they, are, they have been trialling a longer rail container recently and we were actually the first food retailer to utilise that longer 15 metre ro uh, road con uh, sorry, rail container. Uh, and I know they had to overcome a number of hurdles in terms of the, the Department for Transport um, in England who hadn't allowed permission initially for the longer flat trailer that, that, that was required. So that, that, that's now up and running. So we've, we've used that on a trial and that was, that was successful. So, so those sort of innovations are certainly that, um, of use and helpful because anything that can bring the unit cost down, <coughs> um, you know, obviously then makes the... Uh, case for rail more compelling. Mm -hmm. So longer trains, understand that that also requires investment in longer sidings and longer passing loops on the key routes, mm -hmm. sort of east coast and presumably, sorry, west coast and presumably east coast because of the need to divert trains when lines are closed and that sort of thing. So okay. You've certainly given us plenty of things to ask Network Rail when they appear before us. <laughs> okay, um, I think we'll move on. Mary, you've got some questions. Yes about efficiency and carbon emissions because the Scottish Government has set quite challenging targets for reducing emissions and obviously the freight industry has a, a significant role to play in that. So can you identify uses of technology, whether it's vehicles, transport information or logistics that play a part in that um, and will make freight more sustainable and more emission friendly? I think from, from our point of view, I mean, we, we're really keen to it's one of, one of our one of the big things in terms of our ethics and our social goals mm. is to actually improve carbon uh, and general greenhouse gas emissions and we've made some big you know over the last we've been measuring our envir environmental impact since 2006 mm. we've made some significant improvements in for example fuel efficiency um, some of that's been around delivering the right stores from the right depots as part of our network review that we've been doing for the last uh, several years, but um, vehicle technology also helps as well. So we've invested in things like aerodynamic kits. Even for smaller vehicles, we've done uh, trials and we've actually found that the smaller rigid vehicles are actually suited to certain types of aerodynamic kits, which have actually given us a payback on, on better uh, fuel efficiency, which is good. Um, we're also uh, working on dynamic route scheduling. So previously we would have had a sort of bus stop type route schedule uh, for store deliveries. We've now moved that to a daily dynamic routing schedule, which is optimised through software so that we can actually reduce mileage and optimise daily uh, for our vehicle deliveries. Um, I think one of the other things that um, I should mention, I mean, I, I know you had Chris McRae from the FTA uh, here, I think, in, in, in um, uh, February. And um, he mentioned the logistics carbon reduction scheme that the FTA run. And we've been members of that since last year. And I think one of the things that we like to do is understand what the best practice in the industry is. So we're very much um, involved in discussions with the LCRS in terms of 
measures that are being undertaken in the wider industry that we can actually look at uh, employing ourselves as well. Um, well, I, I very much appreciate the, uh, the view of uh, the cooperative group on this because in the end they are also uh, the one that is driving uh, reduced uh, emissions to uh, tr the transport companies but also the shipping lines. Um, so it's high on that agenda as well and it has been for, for a number of years already. Um, Obviously, the impact that we have on emissions in Scotland is, is relatively limited, uh, as we, we spend uh, not that much time in, in Scottish waters. Um, at the same time, of course, and I, I mentioned it before already, uh, if there is a real connection uh, connecting our services directly to uh, other rail hubs in Scotland, then, of course, it will reduce emissions uh, instead of using road as, a, as the main transport mode. I think from our perspective, I mean, we, we've followed similar routes to, as Steve mentioned, you know, we've looked at, at our kind of vessels to look at efficiencies, uh, particularly with SECA, but, but on the other, other areas as well. Um, we also um, spend quite a lot of time looking at our vessels um, where we use this term, we eco-steam. So, again, because we, we have the, the good old bus route, we kind of build in enough time so that wherever possible we can, we can eco-sail. Eco um, We've also done quite a lot of work with customers. Um, the container market traditionally is very dominated by the deep sea sector. Um, and and they, they basically have two weapons of choice. It's 20 foot and 40 foot. I mean, they haven't even gone metric, so it just shows the, the kind of... It's a 20 foot or it's a 40 foot. Um, what we've done quite a lot of is if we've introduced, not, not us exclusively, but the industry has introduced 45 foot containers, so we're working quite closely with carriers to say, well, can you, A, can you move from, particularly on intra-European um, movements, um, you know, example being some of the, 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 the drinks industry that we take from Scotland into, say, Russia or, or the Baltics. So we've tried to introduce a 45 foot to them, uh, which gets more capacity in. Um, and again, I think, you know, we'd pick up Steen's point, that if we, could, if we could plug into either rail or road, which is more efficient, it would certainly be a first choice for us because we have a lot of the big um, manufacturers in Europe that, that, that the indirectly and directly measure our carbon footprint as part of their supply chain. So someone like Mars, as an example, they actually want to know about how are we handling their cargo in our small uh, link in the chain so they can give an overall uh, carbon footprint from point of origin to point of destination. Or strategies um, on on the horizon that, that could be adapted or used by the freight industry to to help to re reduce your emissions. I mean, obviously the one in marine is is there's uh, people are looking at LNG vessels, hmm. um, but again, as, as Steen's well put, it, it's a big investment and hmm. it's a it's a it's a it's an investment for you know. I always kind of draw the con you know the, the the analogy that it's an investment not like buying a car, it's an investment like buying a house. Mm. You're in it for a much longer time. Yeah, so it's and, long term. And, and it's a, yeah. so you know we've all got used to that. You know we've got a car and we can buy it on lease for three years and when it's finished we give it back. Mm. You don't do that with a house. And an LNG investment in marine side mm. is more akin to a house investment than a car investment. To to, to use a, a a kind of analogy. So obviously people are more um, aware of is, the, is this route going to be for a much longer period. Mm. Are there any strategies or, or innovations in, in our neighbours abroad that are used that, that we could use here that we're not taking advantage of? I think the only one that, that I would put is, is trying to maximise or make the best use of the options of modal shift. Mm. You know, play the right suit of cards for the right type of movement mm. you know um, I think we could all do a little bit better at that than, than, than be I still think there is a degree of adversity between sectors as mm. opposed to collaboration how you change that I'm not, I'm not quite <laughs> you've sure you've not got the answer for us <laughs> not no. the answer for that one no. <laughs> maybe one of the suggestions and um, maybe you've actually seen it when you visited the, uh, the port of Rotterdam uh, during the development and the investments that they've made in the second mass flock today, uh, and they've put a target up uh, how the cargo that is arriving at the mass flock needs to be moved to the hinterland. 
Uh, and I can't remember the percentages by heart, but I think it's it's something like 35% of the cargo needs to be moved on, on rail. So, I mean, if there is a, a wish for the Scottish government or someone to uh, to make a certain infrastructure or investment, uh, then, I, then my suggestion would also be to put certain um, targets on there in terms of how the cargo needs to move to the hinterland. Okay. Mr. Kirkhope? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that support, again, modal shift, but I mean, modal shift in terms of the percentage mm. of reduction in, in emissions is, 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 is a very small percentage for ourselves, and we're always going to have to deliver to the likes of Loch Hillped. We're never going to have a rail uh, option to get there. Um, and I think what, what we've done is worked on looking to maximise vehicle fill. So, for example, consolidating product within the vehicle, having multi-temperature vehicles now, rather than sending separate grocery and... Uh, fresh vehicles, for example. Um, we've been looking at, we're doing a lot of trials at the moment around trying to fit more products in the roll cages that we actually use to deliver, to store, mm. without damaging products and without creating cages that are too heavy for drivers to actually wheel into stores and, and, and store staff to handle. So there's, a, there's, a, there's quite a sort of you know, tight line in terms of making sure that things are safe, but also maximising that vehicle fill so that we're not... Um, transporting fresh mm -hmm. air, for example. Mm -hmm. um, just one other thing in terms of, um, I think it was a statistic that was mentioned um, from the Road Haulage Association around the amount of empty running that there is, um, certainly on return legs, mm -hmm. it's up to 30%, I think, as an industry yeah. um, uh, figure. And what we've started to do is actually, we now backhaul uh, waste from our stores, segregated waste, so that we can actually uh, recycle that at our distribution centre um, and we also do uh, quite a lot of supplier backhauling um, for suppliers that are actually based out so for example Campbelltown cheese we've backhauled for a number of years it fills the vehicle on the way back as well as the way out so okay can you identify any processes of integration or collaboration, whether it's at consolidation centres, sharing containers between operators and combining flows that would make freight transport more sustainable? Um, and, and how can different sectors within the industry be encouraged to do that more? I think from particularly from, from our sector as, as, as a container operator, um, it is a challenge. It, it is finding, again, we would probably be the enabler to a consolidation centre of coming to us and saying, right, we have this, we've consolidated this cube of, of cargo, can you please con uh, provide us with a container? Um, it's an area that the container sector, we are primarily a full container movement. Um, if we could plug into that kind of network, it would certainly be of interest to us. Yeah. How how that is is driven um, is 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 a much more difficult question, I think. Uh, but we would certainly we would support it because uh, it's a sector that I can't even get into at the moment. You know, to to me, that's predominantly road a road freight yeah. weapon of choice rather than 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 anything for us. Difficulty logistically organising it, or is the main difficulty resistance between organisations and companies within the sector? Um, I think it's an understanding of. I use the analogy that that if if someone is thinking about moving something, whether it's this big or this big, mm. the default is road, because we're all comfortable with it. We do mm. it. We you know, our second default has come a long way in that being rail because for a while everyone mm. had a blind spot to rail and I think the difficulty for, for particularly the container sector or the, or the maritime sector is we're an even further away blind spot because everyone's idea of a, of a voyage is mm. you go away for years and you know it's all it, it's something that you, they don't they don't correlate <coughs> the two things. and I think one of the things that we're, we're trying to do particularly uh, as Unifeeder is, is actually break that down a little bit and, and get people as we've proven from Felix Dot to Teesport, we can move product from Felix Dot to Teesport in the same time as it can be moved by road. Mm. But I'm not restricted. I don't need for every container, I don't need another truck. I can get much more mm. on one vessel. So I think it's a, 
education is probably not the right word, but it's it's an awareness of the options mm. that 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 marine is an option and that rail is an option. Um, that's the challenge, certainly we find, of getting people to to think a little bit. Yeah. Because the default is road. Dare I say, think outside the box. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'll write that one down. Use that one. <laughs> I couldn't resist, I'm sorry. No, I know. <laughs> Mr Van Aest. Um, I, I think it's interesting because on the uh, on the continental side in, uh, in Zeebrugge, where, where the other side of the route is, uh, we have two of our main customers, uh, ECS or C2C and, and 2XL, that actually have a consolidation center themselves uh, in the port. Mm. Um, so they bring a lot of the uh, supermarket products, for example, from all over Europe or let's say uh, France, Belgium, the Netherlands, consolidated in the port and then have a, a full box that is moving from uh, from Zeebrugge into the site. Mm. Um, as far as I'm aware, that similar infrastructure is not necessarily in place on the Scottish side, uh, where you consolidate cargo into a certain uh, consolidation point uh, and thereby move uh, full boxes uh, from the site into Zeebrugge. So there's an imbalance in the trade that we have. So we carry uh, more empty units from Scotland to Belgium than the other way around. Um, and that's unfortunate. And of course, if there's a consolidation point uh, where these companies can jointly uh, attract volumes to, then uh, I think that would be beneficial. And in contradiction, I do the exact opposite. <laughs> <laughs> we should talk. <laughs> I, br I bring more empties in than I take yeah. full out. Okay. Mr. Kirkhope. I, th I think um, there's certainly merits in looking at consolidation. I think it's probably about having an honest broker, perhaps, for the, for the, for the big retailers, for example, mm. so that, for example, if there was a shared service, whether it be a train or whether it be a facility. If, for example, Mr. Tesco's volume increased by 50%, you know, who, who would actually, you know, what would the priority be? And so I think it's about, you know, whether that would be working with the British Retail Consortium or the Freight Transport Association or having someone like Malcolm's or Russell's, you know, who, who already deal with a number of different retailers. I, I don't know the solution, to be fair. Um, so... But certainly, I, th I think that there is merit in looking at it. We, we might well be forced to look at consolidation when we start looking at urban deliveries in, in London, for example. Um, some significant talk about reduced mm. emissions in, in central London around uh, diesel particulates and that sort of thing. So it might be something that, that we're forced to look into um, or encouraged to look into uh, further. Okay. Can I move on now and ask you about government support? Because it's been suggested to us in previous evidence that it's time the government updated its freight policy. Is that a view that you share? And if you do, what would you like to see changed in the policy? Who would like to start? It's a difficult question to answer since I'm not uh, in detail familiar with the uh, with mm. the policy itself. Uh, but like I said before, I think if there is a wish from the Scottish government, if we just look at the DFDS operation to uh, to continue this operation that I highlighted before, uh, then it does require that there is a certain interest from the Scottish government mm. in in either way. Um, and like I said before, we don't require subsidies to run the service for a number of years. Uh, we want the service to be sustainable for the next 30 years. And if we indeed look at purchasing a new vessel, um, an LNG propelled vessel, this is a, an investment that you do for 30 years. Um, so I would urge, and I think that's also what we agreed in the MOU, that the Scottish Government, uh, um, let's say, in their policy makes a uh, um, a strategic decision to also support uh, ferry services in and out of Scotland. Mm. I, I would agree. I think it's, 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 it's gaining the collaboration of people. You know, I, I think one of the difficulties that, 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 that we find is everybody is driven by their own requirement of, of, of time and cost. And I think if there was an option to to even pull together the interested parties and, and, you know, think outside the box and say, hey, what if, what if we could do that? I think that would go a long way of, of dragging people, kicking and screaming to actually sit in, you know, around a table like this and say, right, you know, let's have a discussion about what, what, what's the art of the possible. Um, you know, we, we can influence all of us individually in, in a, you know, a, a very, very small way. Um, but once you actually start to get people to, to join up, I mean, you know, again, I go back to the discussion that we, we had in Felixstowe where we're moving cargo uh, for a retailer. You know, we managed to get the retailer, who is the cargo owner, his his 3PL, who was 
doing the road transport and ourselves. And we actually got an agreement from all three of us that the way to do it was better. Um, which to me was a great step forward because actually the, the 3 PL was giving away work. Um, but they still gain because they, they, we actually, in effect, work for them. So it was breaking down those traditional barriers of, well, I'm not going to speak to you because you're actually my competitor or I perceive you as a competitor. I think if, if there's something that, that, that any government or anybody could do is, is to pull those people together and actually get them to even just agree so that at the end of the thing you can say, you know what, we've actually, we can achieve nothing or we've got five points we can we can have a look at. Um, then it would, uh, and I think you'd find the industries are all willing. I think it's just that enabler. And I think the honest broker is the right thing. Because if I do it, or DFDS do it, we're going to perceive that, well, why is he doing it? Because he'll want to know what I'm, you know. So there's immediately this, whereas if there's an honest broker that says, I'm collecting information, that says, if I put it all together, it makes a different picture that makes more sense. Would you accept that picture? The answer would probably, yeah. I, I probably would look at it. You've almost answered my <laughs> next question, Mr. Barkin, and I'll, I'll come to you in a, in a moment, Mr. Kirkhope. Um, it almost seems as if the time is now right for the government to introduce a strategy, a freight strategy, to pull all those strands together, to be more focused, to set long-term goals, to get everyone together. Um, is, is that a view that you would share? I would. I think. I think it is. It. it the strange thing about the logistics injury is it's huge, but actually a lot of people know a lot of people. So it's very it, it's a contradiction in some ways. And I think to get to have a strategy that people can dare I say, if we could see a strategy from anybody that said within this period of time we're gonna go from there to there, mm. I actually would use that as a weapon internally to my board to say, mm. I think we should put a bigger vessel on the Grange Mouth Service, because this is this is a strategy. This is mm -hmm. this is going to happen, um, and we think it'll we, we can believe in it. I, I think it gives it, it, it certainly puts a stake in the ground, mm -hmm. and it would give people a direction. You know, it, it, it we can all base. You know, mathematics is a wonderful thing that it, mm -hmm. it's absolute, but you can make it say what you want. Um, but if there's something there, that you said right, there's the strategy, mm -hmm. and it says it's going to go. The freight tons are going to go from there to there in X years you could buy into it and use it as a basis for our commercial discussions. Because I don't think we can drive those. No, no we, we're not, we, none of us, well, certainly us two, we're not cargo owners, as I would mm -hmm. call it. We, we, we're purely a service. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we're, we're unfortunately the petrol that nobody wants to buy, but they have to because mm -hmm. it makes the thing work. Yeah. Mr Kirkhope. Yeah, I, mean, I think I would agree if that, if that forum had the right uh, stakeholders in it, then I think that would be really, really useful in terms of understanding a sort of joined-up approach going forwards. And I mean, quite often, some of the communities we're service, serving in Scotland, that it isn't about the competition, because we're actually quite often the only store either on an island or in a particular town. So it's not always about you know being afraid of, of what Tesco are doing or the, the other retailers. Um, so we'd, we'd certainly support any strategy that, that brings that sort of... Um, brings that strategy together in terms of the, the, the overall um, uh, the overall sort of Scottish um, uh, strategy and framework. I can only agree. And I think uh, if there is an overall strategy where you say that the certain, um, well, that the cargo going in and out of Scotland needs to travel in a certain way, uh, reducing carbon emissions, for example, uh, then I think it will also require, or it will also allow um, commercial parties to also buy in and, and, and present this to their board and say, okay, this is where the Scottish government wants to be in, in 10 or 15 or 20 years. Um, and this will also enable us to, like I mentioned before, if you make a business case, um, you put in certain assumptions. Uh, if we can derive those assumptions from the strategy that the government is forming, uh, then it will definitely reduce the risk that is associated to a certain business case. So it will only allow private companies to uh, to be more interested in, in being involved in the strategy that the government has, has put forward. Okay, thank you. Um, are you aware of any infrastructure schemes in Europe which highlights the best use of government intervention and funding which could transfer to Scotland? You 
have the TANTI program that I mentioned mm. before, which is a European-wide program. Um, and, and I believe that the, the call has been uh, oversubscribed with, uh, I don't know how many billion euros. Uh, so it seems that that is a, a suitable mm -hmm. measure. Uh, but I think Scotland actually falls within that or could apply within that. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Mr. Barker? Um, other than the 10T one, no. Um, I mean, the more provocative one is obviously I work for a Danish organisation and the Danish government look very favourable on shipping companies in mm. lots of ways. <laughs> mm. But that's a different yeah. kind of, you know, that's a much wider mm -hmm. perspective. But I think it's uh, uh, different, you know, different regimes look at, at, at how they uh, drive their commerce in mm. different ways. You know, we, we see... I mean, it's 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 a slightly flawed one at the moment, but obviously the, the 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 Russian economy was was very supportive for a while of of the shipping sector, mm -hmm. you know, um, and that's kind of gone a bit awry at the moment due to a certain gentleman's decision. Yes, Mr. Kirkhope. Um, no, I mean, uh, I, I've been asked to contribute to a, to a few EU. Um, um, sort of work streams in terms of um, uh, I think the, the last one I was talking to were um, the Weast Flows project who were looking at um, port locations and, and um, sustainable logistics um, but um, yeah and I think I think the, the, the organizations do feed into those sort of um, workflows and I know Cess Trans who are responsible for uh, looking after local lo local transport in, in Edinburgh and, and <coughs> the Indians. They were heavily involved in that project as well. But, um, okay, thank you. Thank you, convener. Thank you, Mary. Uh, is there a take-home message that you would like to leave us with um, today? And is there anything specific that you would want our committee to ask of the government? If I, if I can start on that one, um, please. I, I think a number of these things have been discussed already, and, and for me, there's three key takeaways. One is, of course, we discussed the port situation, um, and, and I think there needs to be a clear view from the government where uh, how uh, four ports can operate, uh, let's say, a number of ports on the east coast of Scotland without any firm competition. Uh, so that's one. Uh, the other one for us is that there, there should be a look at, uh, at multimodal transport mm -hmm. and, and potential infrastructure investments in that. Uh, and then thirdly, um, and, and this will be related to the MOU that we signed with Transport Scotland and with the Scottish Government, um, eventually we will come to a conclusion with Transport Scotland uh, and, and then we will come with a proposal, with a joint proposal as regards the future of the service. Uh, and my, uh, uh, my request would obviously be that, that whatever your takeaway from, from these uh, sessions is, uh, that that will also be uh, evaluated together uh, so that there is a sustainable future uh, for this route as well. Okay. Thank you for giving us three and for being so concise. Mr. Kirkhope. I, th I think just one thing to say is, I mean, logistics is sort of the one area it's probably least visible to our customers, but it's one of the, it's probably the lifeblood of actually getting the products onto the shelf available for customers. So I think anything that highlights the importance of that, and I think this, this committee, um, you know, it, it's actually really good that this committee is actually discussing this, this whole topic because I think it's, it's vital that it's brought to the front. So that, that's really welcomed. Um, I think in terms of um, just making sure that we've got robust connections in terms of looking at those key trunk routes, the A9, the A83, I think if, you know, in terms of weatherproofing those and making sure that they're fit for purpose going forwards, uh, I think that's one, one other sort of key message. Um, and, and just one other thing, I'd like to just open up an invitation to the committee if, if they would like to come and visit our uh, multi-temperature site out at Newhouse, they'd be more than welcome. Okay, thank you for that invitation. Mr Barker. Um, I think one thing is, is, is not to lose <coughs> sight that Scotland needs options in terms of maritime connections. It would not be, in, in my view, a major step forward if, if DFTS stepped out of the market. It wouldn't help me. I would not gain from it. Um, I think an observation, uh, adding to Steen's point about fourth ports, um, we currently service the ports of Tyne and Tees, who are 50 miles apart, and they both do reasonably well. So don't be frightened of the future. Don't fear competition. And I think the point of, of, of actually 
through maybe a freight strategy, making Scotland an easy and progressive place to deal with. You know, I think the, the, the I certainly get my, I had the most questions from my colleagues in the rest of Unifida when the independence vote was on. Because all of a sudden, everyone kind of understood that Scotland was a separate place and that it had a different dynamic. Um, I mean, they were even asking me as, you know, my Danish colleagues were saying, well, when we go to Grangemouth, will I need my passport and things like this? So it actually heightened people's view that there is another economy. And I think to actually stake a claim to that economy and say this is what we want to do with it would not be a bad thing. Um, as a general comment, really. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Are there any final questions from members this morning? In that case, can I thank each of our witnesses for having made their experience and expertise available to our committee this morning. We're extremely grateful to you. Um, that now um, closes our evidence session and we'll now pause to allow the witnesses to leave the room. Thank you.